Ortona was valued by the Allies principally for its harbour to help resupply the 8th Army in its push northwards. It was decided, therefore, not to bomb the town in advance of the attack, thus avoiding the risk of damaging the port facilities. Another factor was the belief that the enemy would not make a stand here, but would continue to fall back under the weight of the Allied advance. In fact, the German plan was to halt this advance for the winter along the Gustav Line, of which Ortona was the eastern extremity. Defending the town were units of the 1st Parachute Division. They'd already acquired considerable street fighting experience in Sicily, and their defences within the town were prepared with extreme thoroughness. With a medieval castle, which was at that time substantially intact, as the focus of their defence, the German plan was to hold the northern part of the town and to funnel the Allied attack into the main square by means of demolitions blocking all routes through the town but the main one, the Corso Vittorio Emanuele, which was left invitingly open. A battalion of the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, part of the 2nd Brigade, 1st Canadian Division, was entrusted with the task of taking the town from the direction of the Orsonia Ortona Road. And eventually, uh, on the 20th of December, uh, under cover of a uh, tremendous rolling barrage, uh, I think it was called Morning Glory, uh, our company uh, uh, was one of the ones which uh, went into the assault uh, onto the outskirts of Ortona. Uh, my platoon was uh, a lead platoon, and uh, we found that we could follow very closely behind uh, the barrage, uh, 75 to 100 yards. Uh, there was a railway embankment on our right, which provided some cover for any shells that did happen to fall a bit short, and uh, also served as a dividing line. And we were able to uh, advance uh, sufficiently rapidly that we were able to uh, to uh, take possession of the German positions uh, before the defenders really had a chance to become organized and to, and to uh, resist us. Uh, there were one or two uh, sharp, uh, intense uh, firefights, uh, which just slowed us down temporarily, but uh, uh, when the action was over, we were uh, firmly... Uh, entrenched uh, on the outskirts of Ortona. We were just on the, for the first line of sc scattered houses uh, at that stage, and there was a, uh, uh, quite a, quite a, a large uh, open space uh, in front of us. Uh, it's hard to remember the exact depth of that. I would think it was 75 to 100 yards. And then the main built-up area, the, the, the highly centralized built-up area started at that time. Uh, it was really just another Italian town, uh, except for the great uh, dome of the cathedral, which had been blown in half by the Germans as a roadblock. Uh, and uh, this was visible on the skyline, particularly from the south. Having reached the outskirts of the town, the Edmontons consolidated their positions in preparation for the attack on the town itself the next morning. We started our attack into town, my company, uh, which was the company, hopefully, at the Regiment. And we didn't get very far. It was a considerable opposition from the Germans, and um, my company, which uh, I presume I had about 95 men when I started. In two hours, it was decimated uh, to about 30, just over 30. Company commander, Captain Stone, uh, decided to, uh, to uh, uh, split the company into three, three uh, units. Uh, he would command uh, one unit, uh, as well as the whole company, of course. Uh, the company sergeant major would command the other unit, and I would command the third. Dugan and I charged across the open ground, and, and uh, I'm sure the enemy were completely nonplussed by this almost suicidal move on our part. But they got out of there very well, camouflaged the trenches, and um, hiked away. With, and my sergeant major was a first-class shot at a field day shooting, and that's how the thing went. This outflanked a quite a substantial number of Germans, and. Uh, D Company took, if I remember correctly, um, about 
oh, perhaps 12, 15 prisoners, including a very arrogant German sergeant major, uh, all of whom I escorted back to battalion headquarters. Daring leadership by Captain Jim Stone and his young platoon commanders succeeded in forcing a foothold on the edge of the town's first main square. There was a great deal of fighting uh, around the square that day, and uh, other companies were involved, of course, over on the other flank. And uh, the, the advance was sustained uh, up to the square, uh, which was uh, the, the stop point for the night. While the Edmontons were engaged in their battle for the square, a company of the Seaforth Highlanders fought for possession of the church known as Santa Maria di Constantinopoli on the southern approaches to the town. This church was to become the Seaforth's headquarters as they too were committed to the main battle in support of the hard-pressed Edmontons. Commanding the Seaforths was Major Sidney Thompson, who on the morning of the 22nd of December 1943 was promoted Lieutenant Colonel. But uh, the Edmontons came up against pretty heavy opposition and so the Brigadier decided to commit the Seaforths as well. So we crossed through them onto the north side of the town and we divided it up. They fought on the south side and we fought on the north side, with the main highway being the dividing line, the main highway through the town. For the Edmontons, the way ahead lay across the town's first square and down that main highway, the Corso Vittorio Emanuele, towards the shattered dome of the San Tommaso Cathedral. But to move anywhere in the open was to invite a murderous hail of machine gun fire from well-placed and well-concealed German positions. But I've um, talked to my commanding officer. I suggested to him that as the Germans use noise um, to great effect, uh, uh, diving stukas and moaning mini mortars, that um, perhaps we could try the same thing. And so uh, as a squadron of tanks came up, and one troop with my company started through the town with, in low gear with... Uh, Sirens screaming, and the main armament firing forward down the road and the house on its side, and the other armament uh, shooting sideways while we traveled under that fire and went forward. And I must say, we made remarkable progress for about a hundred yards. We got to the first square when, unfortunately, the lead tank stopped. And I ran. Uh, the tank with my uh, rifle butt and made enough noise that I got the tank commander to put his head out and I said, why are you stopped? And he said, uh, looks like mines on the road and tanks are very vulnerable in town. And I won't repeat my profanity at the time, but uh, there were no more tank support and I must say the whole momentum of the attack died right then. Once the tank stopped, my infantry uh, kept going and crossed a lap of rows. Got some brothers on the other side, but there was an anti-tank gun sitting in the first square, uh, pointing at the main drag of the 57mm anti-tank gun. And I took my Fiat man across the road and said, fire a rocket through that windshield. And it's pretty windy, and he fired about six feet above the and a gun shield, and I got most annoyed at the world and him, and uh, threw some smoke grenades down in the road and, and took a 36 grenade and ran up the gun shield and, and threw a 36 grenade on the other side. And so we had no more trouble with it. Uh, uh, we got past it, and the anti tank gun sat there as long as we were in Ortona. While the Edmontons battled for a foothold in the town's main street, the Seaforths on their left flank were confronted by a bewildering maze of narrow alleyways and streets impassable to tanks, with virtually every street corner covered by enemy machine guns and snipers. The, the streets were narrow. The buildings were three to four stories high. Um, the Germans had mined 
every intersection. They'd mined the, mined the roads uh, with anti-tank mines and anti-personnel mines. The S mines were uh, with great profusion all over the place. Uh, we, um, if you know what S mines are, you step on them and they bounce up about uh, belly height and then go off. The first thing we discovered, of course, was uh, we, we had to learn the whole thing on the job, and we discovered that control was probably the most difficult, far more difficult than fighting in the open. Uh, you could, it was hard to keep in touch with the troops on your flanks uh, because there's buildings between you. And we found that you couldn't fight in big numbers. You'd have to, uh, we fought in uh, numbers of four and five. It was the best way to attack. And uh, we also discovered that it was difficult to protect our rear. Uh, the Germans, the enemy, could get in behind us and also get into our flanks without too much trouble. That's one thing we learned. And another thing we learned, of course, was that the explosives were probably the best weapon we had, and the hand grenades. Uh, and, of course, uh, we probably didn't have as many hand grenades as we'd like to have because we didn't anticipate using them so much. The streets were, of course, the killing grounds. Uh, and uh, if you moved into a street, bango, uh, everything would open up. Uh, it's interesting that uh, to find out whether... The uh, street was covered uh, by the enemy, and uh, you'd drop some smoke in it, and they'd think you were going to cross, and bango, it would open up the shells up to this. <clears throat> and quite often we'd do this to discover where the fire was coming from. So it's the smoke into the street, and up the other end you'd hear the ta 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 and we'd have somebody watching there, <clears throat> then we'd go after them up there. The German power troops defending Ortona were well equipped, especially with automatic and anti-tank weapons. They were skilled in the laying of mines, in the use of explosives for demolitions, and in the booby trapping of buildings. The mortars and artillery are not very effective for close support in um, uh, street fighting. Now, they can deny approaches, you know, shell roads that are ahead of you, and you can do that kind of thing, but the buildings themselves. That, um, uh, take away the effectiveness of mortars and, and uh, artillery for a close support where they'd be useful to the person who's fighting in the streets. What's needed is a handheld weapon that you can get a fire and do the, much the same, have, reap the same kind of uh, mess that artillery would. Uh, we had pits, but we had nothing that was, uh, had a heavy enough charge to really be useful for that purpose. We had our own uh, anti-tank guns from our battalion, uh, plus the brigade divisional anti-tank guns, the 17-pounders, were brought in to give direct uh, fire support, not against tanks, but uh, against enemy uh, machine gun and sniper posts. The procedure uh, was that we would try to move from doorway to doorway, uh, certainly not in the middle of the street, but keeping under close cover, uh, dispersed in single file. And the, the platoon commander was almost, if not at the front, very close to the front. He had to give the, that type of leadership in that close in fighting. I think one of the things in our town were perhaps my presence was useful, that I demonstrated uh, a certain lack of concern for the enemy sh uh, shots that were flying around. And it made people, everybody, start to wonder, well, what am I hanging back for when he'll go? And I think that is the point of uh, why you need, uh, it sounds a bit egotistical, but let me say bold leaders when you're in towns. Determined and skilled defenders, though the German paratroopers undoubtedly were, at no stage in the battle did they attempt any concerted counterattack, relying instead on their ability to re-infiltrate Canadian-held positions by night. I was dozing off and was awakened by a yell that uh, they had just taken two Germans uh, moving through carrying a machine gun, which they were going to set up in our rear. And... Um, uh, had they done so, of course, it made it most uncomfortable for us. So the lesson that I learned right there was double sentry everything at night you know, to make sure that there is no infiltration.
The Edmontons had begun their assault on the Corso Vittorio Emanuele on December the 22nd. A Company on the right of the street, D Company on the left, with B Company covering their right flank in the troublesome area between the Corso and the Esplanade overlooking the harbour. By the afternoon of the 23rd, A and D Companies had fought their way to the town's main square, the Piazza Municipale. But here, the enemy defence stiffened, and blocking any possibility of tanks supporting an advance on the next objective, the cathedral and the Piazza San Tommaso, was a huge pile of rubble created by the Germans as a tank obstacle. It was mined, and it was booby-trapped. On the 24th, uh, uh, I went forward with Captain Stone uh, uh, to, to have a look at this uh, heap of rubble, and uh, well, he devised a plan... Uh, as to how we were going to proceed. And, uh, and then I went back to, uh, to uh, uh, get my people. And uh, there was a group of, uh, oh, almost a dozen uh, of our men who were coming along the, the street, uh, uh, fairly close to the, to the buildings, but uh, unfortunately not close enough. And a mortar bomb uh, came down right in the right in the uh, in the center of this group, and uh, it caused tremendous casualties. I think that almost every one of them was uh, uh, was either a fatal casualty or, or badly wounded. Defenses were pretty easy in a built-up area. I'd sooner defend than attack in a built-up area. As you know, you've heard of the <laughs> where they would uh, let you into a building and have it already mined and then blow it after you got in. And uh, the Edmonds lost a whole platoon that way. With movement in the streets so dangerous, with ever-mounting casualties and the momentum of the attack reduced almost to stalemate, the realization that movement was possible through the buildings themselves, despite the ever-present threat of booby traps, was a lesson the Canadians learned the hard way. When it, one of our company commanders, the son of the Longhurst, uh, used it and um, took, um, blew through a couple of houses doing it, that, um, I was most intrigued with this thing. It was quite new to me. And he had uh, taken two or three sticks of plastic explosive, tied them on the end of a pole, um, put a long fuse on, lit it, and um, blew hauled through the wall, and his men jumped in with Tommy guns, sprayed the room, tossed some grenades down the stairs and followed them down and cleared the bottom and, and took a house in consequence and then repeated it. Of course, it really takes a while to set the thing up. You can't go through the whole city in short order. But uh, he was extremely effective in what he did and got fairly close to the cathedral in a couple of days in consequence of using it. We used pits to blast the holes or uh, teller mines <coughs> against the wall to make the hole to go through. Uh, they would blast a hole and then a, one, a boy would probably jump through with a machine gun, and <laughs> Tommy gun, and uh, spray it. But usually the, uh, the impact of the wall going down would clear anybody that was in that other room. So you'd get through that way. The object of it, of course, was, as I say, so they didn't have to go out on the street. Uh, they would work their way try to work their way to the top of the building, uh, go through to the next room, and then down. Uh, of course, it's easier to drop your grenades down to the next room or let them roll down the stairs. And quite often, they'd, uh, <coughs> in corridors, our uh, Mill's hand grenade was much better than the German stick because you could bolt it along, whereas the stick had to be thrown. And throwing it, you have to expose yourself more than bolting it. Fighting on the Edmonton's left flank, the sea force had, through the use of mouse holing, broken the stalemate by December the 23rd and advanced to a large piazza quickly named Dead Horse Square from the rotting carcass which remained there throughout the fierce battle which ensued for possession of a school building. I broke the um, platoon down into groups of um, three to four men. Usually, um, if I have an NCO, I put an NCO in charge of each group, but by this time, of course, we had um, some very experienced other ranks, um, privates. And if I remember rightly, um, most groups were in charge of a senior private. 
we 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 took this schoolhouse and um, I think it was a schoolhouse, part of adjacent to a church in any case in Dead Horse Square, and um, I put one section of my platoon, four or five men at the time, into this um, one of the rooms of the buildings. Um, where they settled down for the night, but they were blown up during the night, and in the morning, they, um, all five of them were were covered in God knows how much uh, rubble. The bold leadership shown by the Canadian troops at all levels in what proved to be some of the most intensive street fighting of the Second World War had enabled them by Christmas Day in 1943 to force their way into the center of the town. But the core of the enemy's defence, the cathedral and the castle beyond it, had still to be taken. With the battle for Ortona now in its fifth day, the Seaforth's objective became the Via Tripoli, while the Edmontons continued their fiercely opposed advance on the Piazza San Tommaso, literally house by house. devastation of days of relentless street fighting had reduced the town almost beyond recognition. Few now doubted that the town should have been bombed prior to the attack. At daybreak on December the 27th, Lieutenant Alan Johnson had positioned his scout patrol on D Company's front line on the edge of the cathedral square. So I was there with a small scout patrol and uh, uh, I heard something uh, strange people yelling and cheering. And uh, uh, I, well, having had some experience at scouting, I had a pretty good idea what the situation was. So I advanced at first with considerable caution, but uh, within uh, half a block or thereabouts, I began to find civilians. I was certainly surprised to find them there, and I still don't know whether they were simple householders or refugees from our part of town or, or where they came from. But... Uh, uh, they announced uh, jubilantly to me that Tedeschi had avantied during the night, uh, and they were apparently quite surprised to find him gone at daylight. <clears throat> they cautioned me about booby traps. Oh, and another uh, uh, wry sidelight on the advantage of a well-organized defender in, in street fighting. Uh, one of the first people I met was a, 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 an English-speaking Italian who said, I don't know what took you so long. There weren't many Germans here. I don't think that we were prepared. I don't think that anyone expected, indeed, that uh, Ortona would be held uh, uh, the way it was. Uh, uh, we didn't think that uh, the town as such uh, merited that importance, but of course we, uh, one has to look at, the, uh, look at it from the point of view of the grand German strategy uh, uh, for the stabilizing of their other winter line. The worst aspect of fighting in build-up area is tension and nervousness because you couldn't relax. You're so close to the enemy. You expect him to hit you at any moment. I can't recall uh, seeing more than a passing glimpse of the um, snipers and the machine gunners, but uh, you knew they were there because they were behind their machine guns, behind their sniping rifles and uh, behind their grenades. But you're lucky if you caught a glimpse of anybody or unlucky, whatever the case may be. The street fighting is won by the men and not by the weapons. And the men actually in contact with the enemy and are mostly commanded by junior NCOs. And people have to be really well trained if you're going to be successful in street fighting. Of these junior NCOs, with, you take five or six men and go into danger places and have to keep up the momentum of whatever attack you're making. The lessons learned from the 1941 Fibua training film were validated by the Canadians in Ortona in 1943. The breakthrough achieved by venturing into the buildings and mouseholing through the upper stories confirmed the significance of the vertical dimension as a major factor in urban warfare. <laughs> 